I became really interested in drinking parties, and I realized that the last uh, I'm interested in I'm interested actually in drinking parties, but <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. But it's it's but I like the drinking party only to go to a certain point. You know, it's okay if it drops into Dionysian, like if it drops over the edge. Okay, it dropped over the edge. But I like that area where where it comes and you're quite lubricated and the tongue is lubricated and it's, I like that. And I think that that's why the drinking occurred in the soup, in the symposium. It's to lubricate the tongue, you know, it's to, to lubricate the brain. But, so, you know, it, it, you know, in the symposium it goes to a point, I, I am mad what I like of the image, and I, I made a drawing where <clears throat> it, it's the progression of the individuals within the symposium to the point where the only one standing in the midst of all of it is Socrates. And at that point, what I believe is happening is, is, a, is a state of, in, in the same sense as Artaud, a state of babble. He reaches a state of uh, he, re he reaches a state of a, a form of becoming. He he just starts babbling and he shakes. And it's not a it's a state that maintains itself for a considerable long time. And so it's the image of him in the midst babbling and looking up. <laughs> to do a show in Anhedra, the island in, I was going to say the island that he owns, but that's not true. Um, island he has a show. Anyways, he invited me to do a show, and I said, yes, I'll do a show, and the show will consist of outdoor artworks and a book, because I run a press. And the idea for the book I had was a new translation of Hippias Minor. Hippias Minor is one of the early dialogues, and what I like about it is, it, I'm not a classicist, I'm not, I'm not a scholar, uh, but it's arguably the, um, the oddest of Plato's dialogues. It's bizarre. Um, because in that dialogue, this very short dialogue, Plato, through Socrates, uh, uh, argues that the best person is the greatest liar. That truth uh, is, is on, at least on par with someone who can lie very well. And that the excellent man is the man who can get away with lying. And I think it's odd because Plato, uh, arguably, arguably, is one of the greatest philosophers of truth that we know. So why would Plato write this dialogue? And to me, from the very little Greek that I know, turns that, that dialogue turns on one word, which is polytropos. It's the same word that Homer describes Odysseus as, polytropos. And this word can be translated many different ways, of course, like most Greek. Uh, but a new translation of, uh, of the Odyssey by a poet named Stephen Mitchell a couple years ago came out and translated that word as cunning, as uh, infinitely cunning. And it really piqued my ear because older translations of Polytropos uh, translated it as wily and crafty. And that's cool, but it never quickened the heart like reading about Odysseus being cunning. When someone's cunning, you're just looking to make sure that you have your wallet with you. 
You know what I mean? If someone's cunning, you make sure you lock the door after they leave, and then you check the stuff. There's a, something that quickens the heart about that word. And so we translated hippias minor with that in mind, and it turns out the dialogue is different. If you translated polytropos as cunning, and you don't focus on the moral implications of lying, what you realize is the dialogue isn't about lying at all. It's about, broadly speaking, the idea of what the creative act can give us, the kind of choices that are not given or self-evident. And so, it, with a new translation, as all good translations do, is enlighten us in a different way. And we had a great translator, Sarah Rudin, who's a trained at Harvard, whose classes that she's done Homeric hymns, and she did a great job translating. And I like to think that we've um, changed Hippias Minor for the better, to make it more accountable for the idea that Plato, once upon a time, wasn't so rigid and doctrinaire, and, not, and once upon a time wasn't so um, anti-art, which he is. That, that's, that's the key question. Was Plato anti-art? Yeah. Do you think he was anti-art? He believed in the Republic to the laws, he believed that the best art was the art that was so pure that it does not even merit the idea and the word of experience. He believed the best painting were the paintings that only use one kind of paint, if any paint at all. He thought music should be unmixed. That's how James Porter puts it, the classicists. It's, he believed that music should have one tone, and it should repeat over. It's like a, it's like a well, I guess it's like Stephen Reich. I guess Stephen Reich would be the great platonic musician. But even he, even Reich would deviate too much for Plato. Plato didn't believe in mixing. And, and so the purity comes with a kind of rigidness which verges on cruelty. But I think, I think Plato was a, if we believe that he was alive, he was a, a person just like any person. And I think if you knew his personage, his history, you can get a sense of when he turned, when he became hardened. And I think you can make the case for him hardening as a philosopher and a thinker to a point where he would say things like that. I just, I just wanted to say that it's been a great privilege to work on this incredible project that you've designed, uh, which took 10 years, you know, roughly 10 years of books you gathered, you retrieved, and that is, that has been ongoing ever since Divine Rules, and that find, has found for the coming months its realization and its home here at the Giddy Villa. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about the process that led to this, the genesis of this work, how you got to doing it, or maybe not doing it, and, uh, and then we'll talk about your Platonic epiphany. Yeah, well, f firstly, I'd like to say I don't think Plato is anti-art. Um, I, I really feel quite strongly that he believed... Think somebody agrees with me. <laughs> no, no, but I feel like he really believed in art as kind of unlocking the imagination, and that um, you know what he didn't believe is, is this idea of imitation versus visualization. He believed that we can be led through form and through our materials to wider meaning, and I really feel you know really believe that. But um, uh, yeah, as Denasia said, I've been making this over ten years, um, and uh, it began as a I work with found, found objects. Um, my work is really about identity and memory and this idea that an object will trigger an association or memory. Um, and when I began this piece, it was really because I was accumulating in a way. I was kind of <coughs> collecting found objects and, uh, and, and, the, and these books that are all related to ordinary life, so they're about universal human themes that uh, that we share across borders and countries. Um, basically, they're books, encyclopedic reference books, books on en engineering, uh, physics, mathematics, shipbuilding, language, consciousness, um, and and many more. But uh, and 
the way the books are arranged are in the form of a kind of intuitive language. So I arranged them over three months in London um, before having, you know, collected them over all these years. But I arranged them in 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 a sort of form of, of uh, a language where they kind of communicate with each other. Um, so you have titles like Man in the World Over, Next to Feminine Frailty, Next to book on, Books on Needlecraft. There's a lot of uh, books on homekeeping and domestic life. Um, uh, in, a, in a way, the work can be seen as autobiographical as well. There's a kind of, there are a lot of references that are very personal in the work. Um, and uh, I guess I want to, just to give a bit of context, um, I, when I was in South Africa in 2010, I, I was in a small town called Krugerstorp, and um, I went into this uh, pawn shop, and there was a kind of uh, many, many shelves of kind of neglected plastic objects and uh, magazines, and um, on one of the shelves was this book uh, that was alone, and it was published in 1938 in the UK. And it was a religious text called Gold by Moonlight. Um, and in it was inscribed a note from a man to a woman about the uh, restorative powers of landscape. Um, and the, the, when I looked through the book, it was photographic images of trees together with this kind of religious text. And um, this woman, I presume it was her, because it had been given to her, had gone out into the landscape and found these very kind of intricate branches and leaves that um, she placed onto the trees, which mirrored the trees completely. And it is really the most beautiful book, and it told such a strong story to me that it was the first time I became conscious of this idea of a story attached, or layers attached, to uh, an object or book. Um, and so I became interested in the fact that the, the sort of previous lives or the previous handlers of every book that I collected. And I was totally drawn to this material. It was, it kind of found me. Um, so the collecting just happened. I, I mean, I, I visited this man at six in the morning. Uh, he does house clearances, so he, people call and they want uh, their old things collected or it's the deceased. Um, and so some weeks there'd be nothing, and other weeks I'd get these kind of small boxes of gems of engineering books or books of poetry. And um, it, it, it became increasingly moving for me to associate these books with past lives. So Just wanted to say one quick thing, because I know once you start, I don't have a chance. <laughs> My first experience with philosophy, I think it was about eight or nine, were two jokes, very short ones. One was, what's the difference between a man and a dog? And the answer is, a dog knows, but a man knows that he knows. Now, I found that very profound at the time. Clearly, nobody hears. Okay. The second joke was, what did one goldfish say to the other in the tank in the apartment? Of course there's a God. Who do you think changes our water every day? What was your second experience of philosophy? The second joke. The third? <laughs> this moment here with you. No, no. Okay, what was your first experience of Plato? Yeah, who remembers such things? I, re I have other memories, which I can't share with the audience, but certainly not reading Plato. Plato was never a figure in my, uh, shall we say, intellectual development. He really wasn't. I think that um, somehow uh, in my late teens, I found out about and got fascinated, and then we could almost say obsessed with Wittgenstein. And, um, and I, his, naturally, Wittgenstein's relationship to Plato, you know, he brought Plato to his work. He didn't go to Plato's work. He was, he read some things, but he was not deeply engaged with Plato, though it came up a lot and continuously. Um, it's a little, you know, but it was there. It was there as something that, he certainly was much more 
He respected Plato a great deal, a lot more so than Socrates, who he very disparaging about this in his writing. Did you want to say something? No, 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 no listen, no, no, listen. Oh, I bet you do. Come on, say it. No, but I mean, why did you go to Wittgenstein? What, 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 what were you so obsessed with Wittgenstein? Well, I was very interested in language and its effects. I always felt, I felt that um, every, it's, I, I believed in art and I didn't believe in painting, but I was still struggling with it. Now remember, remember, this is before I was 20. So, and I did one of three chairs when I was 20. Moment never knew that when they bought it, or they wouldn't have bought it. But, um, and it was kind of, um, an understanding that all the, all our experiences of things and, uh, and you know all the things about painting and sculpture and all of that. I mean, what do you have with take Kant out of a sculpture? What do you have? An object. Well, they call them bloody objects. Don't I can't stand hearing this word sculpture unless you want to see yourself as part of that history. If, if you're still a modernist, which is about the limits of the medium. Hmm? Painting, sculpture, lithography, blah, blah. But I mean, I've, we finished that off in, in my childhood. That was 50 years ago. And people still talking about their work in sculpture. It, I scratch my head in amazement, I have to say. Take us to heart, would you out there? Some artists? Okay. Go ahead. I always feel like interrupting you when you're not even talking. <laughs> So Jeff, over recent years, um, you've increasingly developed an interest in Plato and the cave and the reflection. I want, can you tell me about this? Um, you know, Dinesh, uh, for myself, my interest in philosophy really started in art school and uh, where I took some philosophy uh, classes and I would have had uh, Plato and Kierkegaard and, uh, and Nietzsche. And I always liked uh, the idea of uh, becoming that uh, would be in uh, a philosophy. And my work over the last, I would say, 15 years has uh, been more involved with, uh, with biology and uh, trying to capture and relate to uh, information that we carry through biology and at the same time and that form of eternal, the metaphysics. And at the same time, uh, with the idea of the eternal through ideas. And so, uh, you know, Plato uh, became more highlighted uh, in my work uh, to present those ideas. How so? Uh, well, to, to make a direct uh, kind of reference, I, uh, I did a series uh, called uh, Gazing Ball uh, Series. And I worked with 19th century plaster casts of you know, really uh, classical works of Bernese, Hercules, or Ariadne, uh, Belvedere, Torso. And also I would work with utilitarian objects. And they would be in plaster. Uh, so you would look at one of these works. I'd have a gazing ball, so it would affirm you, the viewer. And when you become affirmed, it's really dealing with your senses, sense perception, uh, the excitement of the senses. And uh, right away, I think of that as a, you know, procreation, the continuation of the species. But at the same time, uh, these objects would become affirmed. They would also become reflected and affirmed within the ball. And uh, they would fall within kind of the shadows of themselves. And you would go into the idea of the ideal form and into pure forms. And, into uh, the idea of the eternal through idea. One thing that really strikes me is that I have the impression that you turn Plato against himself in a way. You know that what you do is, and that's the case of the Plato, it's, a, it's an object to, to contemplate, but it is also a, an object of banality that is given to us to contemplate. And I think what, what you've done and incredibly and achieved is to make those two things that seem separate, contemplation and banality, you know, dialogue, so to speak. Um, you know, I believe in, again, these two methods of, uh, of the intuition uh, in art, of uh, believing in the intuition, believing in the, uh, the biological. 
uh, but at the same time, you know, trying to be uh, to become and to enhance uh, uh, the intellect and to develop ideas through uh, uh, emotions. When I look at uh, Plato, uh, I think of the act of making, uh, the the sense of uh, of satisfaction from making because you, you know you have to do something. But at the same time, I think the piece captures the violence of the making, uh, the smashing of the form, the twisting uh, of the form. It kind of captures some of that energy, uh, slight nature, and uh, at the, it's very monumental. But at the same time, it uh, it represents you know life cycle. It represents nature, and uh, you know mountains crumble to the sea. And even though you're confronted with this monumentality and this youth, uh, at the same time you have its destruction. It took you 20 years to make it. Why? Uh, well, a lot, a lot of it involved just the development of the idea of the piece. Originally, I wanted to have Plato, uh, not Plato, Plato, pardon, now I'm getting caught. But uh, I wanted the Plato sculpture to be in polyethylene. But uh, polyethylene, you have to have a two and a half to a 3% uh, kind of drag to be able to pull uh, the object out of the mold. And when I was developing the, uh, the object for that, it, I started to lose too much detail. It became too toy-like. And so I uh, decided to keep all the detail, all the undercuts, and to develop it uh, for uh, aluminum. To capture that uh, texture in plaster is very, very difficult. I'd work with artisans and oversee it, and maybe one person would have a really nice organic feel, and they would have this uh, organic quality, and I would stress that and tell them not to make things so hard and uh, angular in another area, and maybe I would come back a week later and everything then would be too organic, too plant-like. And it was just a, a constant uh, trying to uh, uh, capture uh, what happens to Play-Doh, and to do that within uh, plaster. I also had a studio uh, closing. I moved my studio. I, my fabricator went uh, bankrupt. And so there were different uh, aspects that just happened there. And uh, then the realization of it, uh, because it's not just a hollow object, there are actually 27 organic forms that like male, female kind of joints all are laying on top of each other in an organic manner. Uh, you never see that unless you install it, but uh, it gives it kind of an, an internal uh, uh, kind of depth or uh, being. And what about the scale of it? How did you come to defining the very scale? Plato. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Plato always say that, uh, you know, the first thing in dealing with art is scale. And so, you know, it's an intuitive process, but whenever I begin any work, uh, I decide finally to commit to uh, making it, uh, you know, I'll deal with uh, its scale. And so it always felt that it should be, you know, around 10 and a half feet in height and the, the different dimensions.